All right, welcome everybody to Quick Fix Golf Wednesday nights. If you'd like to join us, all you need to do is go to quickfixgolf.com slash webinars or golf webinars, something like that. But, or, or look under golf lessons and then go down the, the little uh, menu and you'll see webinars in there. And you can join us any Wednesday night. It's absolutely free. We'd love to have you. Somebody else is fooling around back there. But tonight's topic is going to be reading the golf course. I don't know what else to call it. It's not really core strategy. But, you know, people think about reading greens. They don't think about reading the golf course. And uh, really what inspired tonight was one of our junior golfers wanted to know about, you know, how do you play a golf course for the first time? And we used to have that problem back in the 70s when I used to try to play this game to eat. Um, lots of times in Europe you couldn't get a practice round because the country clubs were very stuffy and, and whatever and, and – uh, and, and it was a different system than we have here. Where we qualifiers were on Mondays, there was on Tuesdays. And um, you couldn't necessarily get a chance to play the golf course. And what we used to do is drive around it because you didn't have golf courses like you have here today where there's houses in between, so you can't drive around it if you wanted to. But one of the first things we always looked for was whether the greens were elevated or whether they were at the same level as the fairway. If the greens were at the same level of the fairway, we knew that was going to be an easy golf course. You'd have to shoot a really low score to get in because you'd be qualifying on Tuesday to get into the tournament. You know? And uh, so that's that's one of the first things we look for. But there's a lot more you could look for. So let me see if I can look at this. First, the explanation of the slope. I'm going to kill the microphones for a second and have you guys ask questions. Here we go. Here is a place you can go to. NCGA is the North Northern California Golf Association. This is the one I found that was pretty good explanation of the slope. Because a lot of people are not sure what the slope is, and they think the slope determines how difficult the course is, which is not true. Myth number one, slope is the primary indicator of difficulty. But that's not necessarily true. This is wrong. As in the above example confirms, it is the course rating, not the slope. Now, here's here's the thing. Your course rating and all this stuff, you're really at the mercy of the USGA. They're the ones that send a group out to rate the golf course and give it a course rating. And as it says here, as each score a golfer posts is broken down to numerical value known as a differential. Look at this. You've you, you got to complicate this thing. In the course rating that plays the more important role in the calculation, adjusted score minus course rating multiplied by 113, you need a freaking slide rule. <laughs> what the hell the I didn't look at it. The greens are elevated. I know it's going to be hard. If the greens are flat, going to be, it's going to be an easier golf course. Um, but you put the course rating versus slope debate into perspective. It takes more than 20 units of slope to have the same impact as a single stroke of course rating. Which means as a golfer's handicap level increases, the ratio of the importance of the two values changes. But even for a 20 handicapper, it takes five to six units of slope to have the same impact. So... Looking at it this way, the myth number one, two courses with the same slope are of equal difficulty, not necessarily true. A course rating of 71.5 and a slope of 125 is about two strokes more difficult than a course rating of 69.6 .6 with a slope rating of 125. So the slope can be the same on two different courses, and one course could be considered less difficult than the other. Well, slope ratings can be compared between courses. No, can't do that. You can just go read a lot of this yourself. I don't want to bore you with just reading the thing verbatim here. But slope really tells you how proportionally more difficult that particular set of tees plays for the higher handicap for golfers as opposed to the low handicap golfers. The more difficult the tees play proportionally for the higher handicappers, the greater the slope rating that will be issued. That's it. Slope doesn't tell you how the course proportionally plays from any other set of tees. See, so you can read through this and you'll see. So you can't really go by slope rating too much, as I'm going to show you here as we go along on the slides. That, uh, you know, I, I've never used that, that wasn't ever even around when I used to play. So who cared about slope anyway? So now, where's what, what happened to my slides? You stole them. Here you go. The first thing I look for when I look at a golf hole. See, I'm standing on the tee, and I'm looking down that hole. I've never played it before. The first thing on my mind is how is the architect going to get rid of the water, especially around the greens? Because one of the biggest pressures on the, on the newer golf courses today 
and any golf courses that have been redesigned, they know they got to get the water off the golf course for you to start spending money. And that's what it's all about. So if you can't get the puddles off the greens right away, you might still pay money with puddles in the fairway, but you're not going to pay money with puddles on the green. So uh, if you look at, at a golf course like Pendleton, for instance, you'll see a lot of drains around the, the greens. And those drains, I can tell right away which way the ball's going because the ball's going to go towards the drain because that's where the water's going. If you can figure out where the water's going, you know where the ball's going. Same thing with the fairway. If I look at that fairway and I see a slope on that fairway and, I see, and then I look and I say, geez, I see trees over there on the left and those trees are lower than the cart path on the right. So he was going to send all that water into those trees over there. So then I know when that ball hits the fairway, it's got to kick left. So just follow the water. Wherever the water's going or wherever he's trying to get rid of that water, that's where you want to go. I look to see if the greens are elevated. The more elevated the greens, as far as I'm concerned, the more difficult the golf course, period. Because once the, anytime the green is higher than you are, where your ball is, that shot is a heck of a lot more difficult than if the green is at the same level that you're at. Are the fairways flat? Mucho importante. Oh. Because the same thing, I mean, if, if you're going to get kicks to the left or to the right or whatever and get kicked off into, you know, an area where it's going to make your next shot into the green more difficult. Every time you put that ball in a place where it's hard to get anywhere near the hole on the second shot, you just eliminated birdie. You just took it right out of the game. So you, you've, you've got to look at that. And it's pretty easy to see. I mean, maybe it is for me because I'm used to doing it all my life. But um, if you look at it, you know, you can also take your golf club and maybe hold it up level the shaft across the, your face and then see if the fairway is tilted more to the left or to the right. Then you're going to know if that ball's going to go one way or the other. How tall is the rough? There's nothing wrong with it. If you haven't played this golf course before, you're going to play a tournament there or whatever. Walk down one of the fairways. you got to get there early. I mean, I get, I get to the golf course two hours before I'm going to play. You can't show up at 925 with the 930 starting time. You're just wasting, you know, you're, you're nuts. But this doesn't hurt to go down and take a, a walk into the rough and see what the rough is like. Because if that rough is really tall, if it's really difficult, then you know you've got to avoid that at all costs. Because every time you hit in that rough, it's almost a penalty stroke that is somewhat recoverable. Let's say you, you hit the tee shot in the rough and now you've got to bump it out and you're still 70 yards in the green. You've got to take that 70-yard shot and knock it up there within four feet of the hole and drain it to save par. And you've pretty much taken birdie off the table, totally. I like to look at the map on the scorecard. And another thing I like to do, what is it? I get all of these things. things are going to deduct, I deduct the distance from my typical, let's say just in round numbers, I'm going to say it's 250. So let me see if I can hold on. I think I can draw. <laughs> here's the tee box. Here's the fairway. Here's the green. Don't laugh. I'm trying to do this with a. Here's a little flag stick. So I'm looking here and I'm saying, okay, if I hit a 250, if that's my typical drive, then you know how much have I got left here? If I can get that scorecard or get, you know, today, I mean, there's almost no excuse you can get online. And if, if they have it online, you can go ahead and download it. But then I might say, well, I hit my three with two and a quarter. So how much longer do I have in it? Two and a quarter. Can't draw with this thing. I'm trying to write with it, with the mouse. But I, I want to I have an idea of how long my second shots are, are into the hole because you can go on PGATour.com, and I guarantee you, you'll look at the stats, and the guys are a heck of a lot closer to the hole from 125 yards than they are from 150, and they're a whole lot closer to the hole at 150 than they are from 175. I don't care how good you are. So it, it's important. However, if you've got a huge amount of penalty here, if these fairways are tight and there's a lot of rough and the rough is really tall, then those statistics sort of go out the window because – you're, you're going to still do a lot better from 180 yards out off the short grass than you are from 160 yards out in really tall rough that you got to just, I mean, 
unless you're Tiger Woods, you can't get it out of there. Practically, you got to smack and just advance the ball down the fairway a little ways and leave it 50 yards short of the green. See, so that's oops. What did I do here? Okay, now back to this again. So I want to measure that around all these different holes and say, geez, what have I got into the green all day? Deduct your three wood distance from the whole length. So I've deducted the driver, then I deduct the three wood distance. So I can say to myself, well, you know, I can hit three wood here, and it's not going to hurt me that bad because the distance in from there is not as bad as I thought it was. So if 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 it's obvious that there's a lot of rough, the fairways are tight, I'm playing this course for the first time, I'm going to make sure I leave it on the short grass. If I got to tee off with a five wood, I don't care. Now, here's another thing. Let me see if I can clear this out of here. Erase. Ah, you go. Is the ground hard or soft? Today, and especially if it's a one-day tournament, which is what a lot of you usually play, and some of you might play captain's choice or whatever, and you're, you're going out there, you've never seen the course before, say, hey, it's it, the ground's really hard. Okay, then I can take my driver and put it down to the nine-degree loft. Let it run like a jackrabbit. Or... The ground's really soft and it's wet. Then maybe turn the, you know, you've got those adjustments down there. You can put 12 degrees loft on there. Hold the ball in the air longer. There's no reason why you shouldn't do that. Well, that was it. Wow. That went fast. So let me open up the... The mic's here. See if there's any questions. Anybody got a question? Whether it's about this topic or another topic. Bobby, that was a great, uh, great synopsis there. What to do about about reading the golf course? That's uh, some of that stuff uh, I haven't read anywhere else. Uh, but I did have a I did have a question on what Michael something Michael Ray said last week, and I, I go ahead. I want I want you, he was saying if I understood correctly and took the notes correctly he was saying tee the ball farther forward in your stance until you start hooking the hell out of it, and then move it back a little, and then he was saying that was the uh, the ideal position. Do you go with? Do you go along with that idea? All right, did okay. I get it correct? Here's here's what these kids are doing. Here's what it is. If you take here's a driver, and I'm going to make it zero degrees loft. It's got yep. zero degrees loft. That will produce the maximum amount of recoil or ball speed off the face. Right. All right. Hold on. I'm gonna. Somebody make a noise here. Okay, Larry, just listen up a second, then you, I'll turn you back on. Well, wait a minute, I can turn just you back on. Hold on, where are you? There you go. Now, I got it. Uh -huh. that, that'll give you. So a wedge gives you the least amount of speed. Why? Because it's a glancing blow. So the right. ball doesn't get compressed as much. So, yes. But now the problem with the zero degree loft on the driver would give you the maximum ball speed off the face, but you never get it off the ground. It would just squirt along the ground. So, exactly. you know, they back it down to like nine degrees. Let's say 10 and a half. Now, if you, as you swing, here's the ball. If your path, as you come to hit the ball, has already bottomed out and it's on the way up and you tee the ball way forward in your stance and you use the four inch tee, which is the maximum allowable by law. Right? Yeah. I right? Hear you. Then, uh -huh. then you can lower the loft on your driver head because you've added loft with the path. With the path, yes. So if your path is on a five degree upgrade, let's just say, right? Yeah. And you've got a nine degree, right. a ten degree driver. Now you got a fifteen degree launch angle plus whatever the, the the launch angle comes off the face because of the weight distribution in the club head. So that might yes. be seventeen. See. So gotcha. then that uh -huh. means you could go ahead and lower that driver head to seven degrees instead of ten. Because you you got you know you got plenty to, to burn right here. Now you'd only have a ten degree launch angle. Yeah. So if I lower the long, the, the the loft on the driver, then I get more ball speed off the club. So I pick up an extra ten yards or fifteen yards by virtue of lowering the loft on the driver and hitting the ball on the upswing. Yeah. Does that make any sense? 
That makes perfect sense. Okay, that's that's exactly what's what what most of these kids are doing right now. That's why they that's why they talked about how there's so much weight back on Justin Thomas's right foot, ninety three percent at impact because they're backing up and swinging up on the ball. Yes. Now tell me the part now how it relates to whether you're going to be hooking the ball or not. Well, I think he, what, that's what, happens, what, he's what happens is to, this: here's your here's your left foot, here's your right foot. Let's say you put that ball yeah. way up in your stance. Right. So then if your natural path is here to here, as you come around this path, the face could be closed too early by the time you get to that ball. I see. Yeah. So he was saying, put put it even, he said even put it as much as six inches, six inches in front of your left foot. But he was wanting that path to be more through instead of around like that. Right. I'm I, thinking. Yeah, he's, he's doing more of an upswing, straight up. You know, Arnold Palmer used to do the same thing back in his day. If you notice Arnold Palmer, his right arm would be in front of his face. Yes. And he would, and he would you know, go straight up. So, uh, and, and he would drop kick it a lot. I've noticed he, his club would hit the ground first, and then he'd hit the ball. Mm-hmm. Did that lots of times. I didn't, know that. I didn't know that, but that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, they had, yeah. that happened a lot. I, used to, I, I remember seeing that. So, let's see if anybody well, else. I was... Go ahead. I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. I was playing. I was playing around the other day, and after I just said, "I'm going to try what he said," but on the driving range before I started playing, and uh, I determined, yeah, I could put that ball farther forward than I thought. And then when I started hooking it, I that's when I I moved it back a little, and and I found that because I was hitting the ball ten yards farther than I or twenty yards farther than I than I usually do. Yep. And I carried some bunkers that I've never carried and also got hit in the water like I've never done before because I hit the ball so much farther. Um, and it also seemed to help me hit the ball straighter. Uh, that, that was that was kind of a uh, barometer of, you know, if I'm, it, it would keep you from hooking uh, by by moving that ball a little farther forward. Um, but I and I just it didn't quite now you, your, if, your explanation makes sense. It really does. That, that was pretty sound advice with with a you know an asterisk I guess or two. Well, they're, they're all doing it. This is nothing new. The reason why it came along is because of the track man. The track man, in fact, right here. Hold on a second here. I'll tell you exactly right now where to get all this information. Ah, uh, I had the same experience. Really? Who's this? Yep, that's Paul. This is Paul. Hey, Paul. I'll practice the next day. Hi. I tried, I put it six inches in front and hit some longer balls. I'm a 235 driver. I was sitting at 245. Let's go track man. If you go to YouTube and you click on track man truth, and then you get this right here. There's the, there's the URL right there. Okay, good. So you see it. Um, when I put the replay up, you can you can probably look at that comment. But anybody who wants it, I can actually email it to you, it, and it'll explain the difference between angle of attack without changing the club head speed. He actually adds a tremendous amount of distance, and it's all based on moving the ball further up and hitting it on the upswing. So these are hard numbers from the track man. So that's why that's what they're that's what they're doing. So that's nothing. I'll say it's anything new. It's at least two or three years old, but it but it's it's it's. Uh, it works. I, I do it myself now. I, I have the four inch tee. I put it way forward and uh, let it rip. I mean, yeah, well, I didn't tee it. I didn't tee it any higher. Rip it. <laughs> I didn't tee it any higher. Uh, I just uh, found that moving it forward, more forward, uh, was was helpful actually. It's surprising, and it kept me from hooking. Okay, Bill Williams says, "What's my loft?" Um, I have a. A, a nine and a half degree uh, driver, I think. Yes, nine and a half epic. That's what I'm hitting. But I use I use regular shaft, not stiff shaft. In fact, uh, Jack Nicklaus played with regular shafts most of his life, believe it or not. Hmm. So I think I think people overemphasize the stiff and the shaft. Of course, I like a little feel, a little kick. You know, I want to have a little kick to it. Mm -hmm. If there's two things you want a good kick on, it's your golf shaft and a little vodka. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got one, Pastor, you'll like. 
So this, 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 this priest gets moved to a, to a new parish. It's very small, see? And they have a nice welcoming committee and they have coffee and cake and everything. And he finds out through the grapevine that there's a lady in the evening that lives in the neighborhood, see? So the next day he's walking around, he's in the grocery store and he sees her there. So he walks up and he says, Madam, I just want you to know I'm the new priest in town and I prayed for you for more than two hours last night. She said, you should have just called me. I'd have been there 10 minutes. <laughs> You told them in three weeks ago. Oh, did I, I really? Like now you I know I'm like getting it. old. I'm telling the same I jokes. Like <laughs> I still like it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm getting old. <laughs> I can just see myself in the nursing home now, sitting there just telling the same jokes over and over and over again, playing bingo. Hi, <laughs> Maro. Mm -hmm. Anybody else got a question? I have a comment from last week's seminar. Go ahead. I too went out to practice everything that guy was talking about. And I put a stick between my legs so I could actually see where my ball was positioned. In other words, <laughs> I put the ball right in. Not two balls, just one. <laughs> but it wasn't that stick. You know, it, hurt. <laughs> it hurt. It hurt a lot. But I kept doing it. You finally had a stick between your legs. I know it. I just take this little blue pill. And I put the stick. Oh, God. You're going to change the rating on this webinar. Yeah. This webinar's going nowhere. <laughs> Uh, anybody else have a question? Oh. Well, what did you do with the stick? <laughs> well, I know what the bad one said. Is that a stick in your pants, or were you just happy about the lesson? <laughs> I was just happy to stick with the driving range, yeah. Oh, oh God. <laughs> <laughs> All right, anybody else have a question? Oh, Lord. <laughs> Use the stick as an alignment aid. Uh, you. you can't write this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Bobby. Yes. Oh God. This is this is Art. Hey, Art. Hey, hey um, Artie. Hey. Go ahead. Uh, the the course I'm playing now has Bermuda. Uh, heavy Bermuda rough. Do you have any recommendations how to play out of the? Yeah, I grew Bermuda, up in it. I grew up in Bermuda rough. I grew up in it. I grew up in it. I'm from Miami. That's that's what we had, and uh, it is really a whole lot more difficult than a lot of people think. I mean, it's very, especially when it gets, you know, there's different grades of Bermuda today. In the old days, it was Bermuda, but now there's 219. There's this. There's that. There's this kind of Bermuda. That kind of Bermuda. But it's usually pretty coarse, the kind that they use in the rough. Um, and, and the thing you have to make sure you do is to not get greedy trying to advance the ball too far. You just got to say, hey, I'm in this crap. I got to leave this ball in a real good place so that the next shot I can try and get close to the hole. And make sure the club face is open when you hit it. Because when you come down, the, the grass is going to grab the neck of the club. It's going to shut the face. So I take my six iron, for instance, I'm going to hit it, and, I, and I've got the face pretty darn open, almost like I was hitting a bunker shot or something, trying to cut the, cut the ball. Mm. But when I hit, it won't be open. It'll square up. The grass will square it up. Uh, another, okay. another thing you want to do is make sure you use enough loft. I mean, it's really hard. You know, I'm, I'm talking a, a, a pretty deep Bermuda lie is, is rough. I mean, you can sometimes get a good five wood in there. And, and get it out and get the ball rolling. But but look at look at the whole landing area. Really be observant of where you're going. Because the one thing you don't want to do is is compound the air. Okay, you hit it in this crap. Now don't go hit it in more crap. Get it out on the grass where you can keep playing. It's only a stroke you've lost. That's it. And you haven't lost it yet. Because if you can get that third shot up in the green and make the putt, you're still going to make a par anyway. And especially with a par five, right. it's really important to not get too greedy. You know, people get too greedy when they've hit a shot off the ballpark and then they, they, they compound the error. No good. It's only a shot. 
And over the course of a day, if you ended up shooting 86 or 85 or whatever it is you normally shoot, it's only one shot. Don't turn it into three or four shots because you've you got to avoid the big number. You can't make the sevens and the eights because you don't make enough birdies to make it up. I know. Phil can have a triple bogey on the first okay. one and still shoot 72 because he's going to have five more birdies before the round's over. All right. Hope that helps. Can you move the ball back? Does the ball go back in your stance? No, I don't, I, don't, I don't try to trap it. I don't try to put it deep in my stance and trap it. I don't try to do the contrary. I'm putting it a little more forward in my stance, and I'm opening the face. Oh. I'm trying to get the ball oh. up in the air. I see. Huh. Gabish? That's, that's, yep. Okay, yeah. Now, now, another thing you can do is you, you. Line, as you line up for the ball art. Another thing you can do is you take this stick out. <laughs> Do you use a blue stick? <laughs> you flip the ball out with a stick and put it back in the fairway where it belongs. <laughs> put one, ball, put one ball on each side. Oh, Jesus. Any other questions? Okay. Good to hear your voice again there, Art. What I was trying to say is I found my ball was too far forward in my stance. I didn't realize it. Let's see. Well, like on the seven iron. Bill Williams says Justin Thomas has a nine and a half degree. Dennis Duncan says his wife told him he had to go. He had to leave. <laughs> Anybody got any other questions? And now we'll call it a night. But uh, throw us some questions here. That's what we're uh, here for. Bobby, on, on Paul's point, uh, do you have a, a, a quick way to determine the ideal position? between your feet to address like say a seven iron um here's here's the here's the problem and i'll tell you what here wait a minute. that's an excellent excellent question and i'll tell you what for you members if there's a non-member on tonight you're going to get a bonus here watch that. i'm going to go over here and i'm going to go to special reports and i'm going to go to this is good information even if i say so myself uh, because I didn't even really understand this until I started making golf clubs. Let me see here. Where do you put the ball in your stance? Come on. Oh, oh, I know where it is. Hold on. I'm in the wrong section. I need to be in the drill section. Here we go. Let's see here. Bad grip. Uh, where to position your, here? Where to position your golf ball in your stance? If you look at this, I don't want any notes. Get out of here. Right here. There's the URL to get to it directly. But if you just go to the member section and you go into the drill section, and then you look for where to position the ball in my stance, it will explain. The answer is it depends on who built the golf clubs. Because the sole of the club has to go through the ground a certain way, and that's the whole idea. That's why I still play with blades. It's because of the sole of the club. It's so much easier to chip with a blade. And I don't give a, I don't care that I could get another cavity back club and hit and hit the seven iron as far as I hit the six of my blades. I don't care. When I you start fitting for a golf ball, like Dean Snell says, with your putter, then you chip with it, then you hit fifty yard shots with it. You don't hit driver with it. You don't care. You're worried about how the ball reacts from 80 yards and in, 50 yards and in. So I'm not worried about how far I can hit a six iron. I'm worried about how well the sole of the club on a on a on a, uh, a a blade club is thinner, and I can get it down and underneath the ball better than I can with a wider sole that's on a cavity back club. Yeah. So I'm using the blade for one reason, that is to be able to chip with it. Is it an ideal okay? It's, then let me see. Here's a couple other questions here. Hope we got some good ones coming in here. Why do I hit my three wood thin and fat off the fairway? I hit my mid to short iron as well. Help, please. Okay, no problem. Number one, take your three wood and throw it garbage. Because uh, no, I don't really throw it away. I'm only kidding you. Um, you can only use that three wood when you've got an excellent lie and that ball sitting up real good. That's why I carry an 18 degree wood. Uh, a typical five was 19, 
the the five wood pro on Callaway is a degree stronger, so it's 18 degrees. And that's what I'm usually hitting. And a lot of guys on tour have backed off to like 17, 18 degrees because a 15 degree club with today's golf ball is really difficult to get um, and, and to get the head down and into the ball, just like the, with the situation I just mentioned with the blade. So it's not unusual that you'd be thinning the three wood and not, you're not getting real consistent with it. If you have a five wood, try that. If you don't, um, you ought to get one. You can go on the Callaway pre-owned site, and you'd be surprised what you can buy that's practically in brand new shape at a really good price. But if you want a new one, you can always call me. I'll set you up. But uh, the three wood is the problem. Even tour players are dumping three woods here and there. They're going to four woods. And here's another one. Uh, is there an ideal launch angle for maximum distance on the driver? Yes. Um, the problem is that launch angle – is there's not a number in other words there's not a number to say okay launch angle 14 degrees is the ideal no it the number fluctuates depending on your angle of attack and your club head speed if you have a lower club head speed you need a higher launch angle if you have a faster club head speed you can get away with a lower launch angle so uh there's a chart that shows what they need to be um and darn it, let me see if I – I used to have it. Let me see here. And it's changed, and it changes all the times because the balls change. Um, but if you look at – let's see, golf drills. No, I was in the, the special reports. Where's the special reports? You'll see what the typical – if you look at here, how, do, how far do the PGA pros hit the ball? This is the track man, and you can see right here with the driver, average club SP was 112, and here is launch angle 11.2, spin rate 26.85. All right, um, here's your three wood. See, now look at this, he's got a lower launch angle with that three wood. You see what I mean? Five wood, a little bit higher right here. Here's the hybrid. This is old. This is all the way back from 2009, so a lot of this has probably changed since then. I had to get the new one. Um, but these numbers will be somewhat helpful. You can look at the girls, and they're – this will make you feel better, 94 miles an hour. You know, they, they talk about the girls hitting it so far and everything. It's a bunch of malarkey. So here they got a 14-degree launch angle, see? So the launch angle is higher because the club speed is lower. Gabish, hope that answers your question. Anybody got another one? What's going on here? Oh, here we go. Anybody got another question? Hello. Oh, there might be another one in here. David, that makes sense. Thanks so much. Okay. Yeah, I hit the 18 degree. What, what a world of difference. And I'll tell you what, it, it makes you feel a lot more confident because you know you're going to get that ball out of there. However, I still carry the 15 degree, which is the three wood, in my bag. I don't know why, because the only time I can ever use it is if that ball's sitting up real good. So I might decide to sacrifice it for some other thing I want to put in there, like another wedge or something. I don't know, but uh, but for right now, do you I use it off the tee, Bobby? The three wood on the short part. Four? Well, yeah, yeah, that's that's really you know. It up, it's not an issue, so it's good. So right now, I have a driver, three wood, five wood, three hybrid, four hybrid. The irons are five, six, seven, eight, nine pitching wedge, and then I have a gap wedge and a and a sand wedge. So that's what I'm carrying. And I have my mother-in-law in the bag. She's actually dead, but I'm collecting her Social Security. They don't know she's dead. See. <laughs> Hey, I can't help it. It's like 1500 bucks a month. What are you going to say? I hope I don't forget. It's a joke. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Any, anybody heard somebody in the back of this guy today? Hi, Mrs. Lopez. It took, you, it took you a while to figure that one out. <laughs> I, I told you I was an Lopez. idiot already. <laughs> God. Better stay on this webinar for another hour. <laughs> any, any, other, any other questions before we get back on the stick again? Or see, Debbie, there's a right-handed golfer. You're trying to keep your left to wrist flat at the top of the stick. backswing. Okay. Good question. Do you try and keep your left 
wrist flat at the top of the backswing. Now let me show you. Here's I think I've got Rom here. Where's Rom? Here he is. Now he has his wrist bulged. See that? Um, I think one of the things that Sowers always did so well, at least this was what I expressed to him, that his real saving grace was watch his left wrist here. Now watch his left wrist. See how it's sort of bulged right there? See that? So you're either going to bulge it at impact, so or you're going to bulge it at the top of the backswing. Take your pick. I don't see any problem with having it bulge at the top of the backswing. If we look at Hogan, he was big on that. You can't really see that well because this is old video and it doesn't show. You know, one thing is you feel like you're doing it. Another thing is whether you're actually doing it or not is something else. Here's, uh, where the heck's his name here? Where is he? Or oh, Fanal. He has, let's see if I have him downline. You'll see he's, yep. He's probably going to have a bulge wrist. No, it's not really bulged. But then we look at uh, DJ. Dustin Johnson, is that his name? Where is it? Now, you know, he's got a super bulge wrist. And like uh, Butch Harmon said, I wouldn't change that because he, never, he won't be able to play it. I mean, he's played like that since he was a kid, so I wouldn't I wouldn't deal with it either. But you look at his club face right here. It's really closed, big time. And his left wrist is very bulged. So, I mean, if your left wrist is bulged, the only – Difficulty, if if anything, is that you're going to have to keep see see how he keeps that left hand moving. He doesn't allow his hands to come over where Ernie else, because he has a neutral grip and a neutral position at the top. He can rotate his forearms over like this, and I'd prefer that because then I don't have to worry about trying to have having the ball go left on me under pressure or something, where a guy who has a bulge wrist like Tom. Uh, um, Tom Lehman, he has to worry about the ball going left on him. You concern yourself with a club swing weight. Is the normal swing weight for irons around D3? Well, here's – here's here, well, look, I'll leave this club right here. Here's, here's – swing weight is nothing more than a balance point. I can make this club weigh 200 pounds, and it could still be D3. It could weigh 5 pounds and be D3. D3 is just a measurement of where the balance point is. See, so um, sometimes that's sort of oversold to say, well, it's D3, it's heavy. No, it's not, that doesn't mean it's heavy. It just means the balance point is here. If it's less than D3, the balance point's over here. If it's more than D3, it just means there's more weight towards the head than there is towards the rest of the golf club. See, I can take, I can put a little insert right here with a little 20 gram weight, and I can take this thing to like a C7 or something. Why would you want? Different D1, 2, or 3. What's the difference? Well, um, Nicholas used to say he'd like to have his irons at D4 because he felt like it gave him better tempo. Mm -hmm. Because if the club felt a little heavier to him, it made him take the club back a little slower. But mm -hmm. when Ping came out, and Ping was so popular, Carson <laughs> Solheim, most all his clubs were C9, which were really light compared to the rest of the market. He was way in the other direction. And um, mm. had the head very light by comparison to the grip and everything else. But it, it doesn't mean it's changing. It doesn't mean a D3, the club overall weight of the golf club, weighs more than a D1 club. But it could. But um, I don't – you know, here's, here's the thing. If you want to make a perfect set of golf clubs, here's what you have to do. You take out the heads when they show up. You find the heads from wherever, and you weigh them. And they should be exactly seven grams apart in weight. If they're not, you know, and this just has you have to have the luxury of having several sets in stock. Let's say you buy fifty sets from a company. You cherry pick all the ones. This is what I used to do years ago when I did a lot of clubs. 
I cherry pick all the ones that were exactly the right weight, and the ones that weren't, I sent them back. <laughs> Don't send me other ones. I said those are the weights are off. But if I have every one of the clubs weigh exactly what they should weigh in the club head, and then I buy enough shafts where I can pull, you know, you, these shafts can come in boxes of 150, and I buy, you know, 300, 500 shafts, then I take those and I cherry pick them. So let's say I want those shafts to weigh 100 grams. So I pick out all the ones that weigh 100 grams and make one pile. All the ones that weigh 101, I make another pile. All the ones that weigh 102, I make another pile. The ones that weigh 99, I make a pile. The ones that aren't in any of those numbers, I send them back and tell them to send me more. And then I take the grips, and you buy those grips by the 150 in a box. And I get out eight grips that weigh identical. Let's say they all weigh 53 grams. And I put eight shafts that all weigh 101 grams. And I put all the heads exactly the right weight. And I just glue the club together. You've got a perfect set of golf clubs. Perfectly uh, 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 matched, this frequency match, and everything else to go with it. They're perfect. That's how you build the perfect set of golf clubs. And that doesn't happen very often. That's why normally what they do is they put weight in the neck, you know, at the factory to, to let's say, a five iron head is, is two grams short on what the weight ought to be. Well, they'll put two grams of lead powder into the neck of the golf club. I use lead tape on the outside. I'd rather have it there because I want it behind the golf ball. I don't want it necessarily in the neck. Does that hmm. make any sense? Yes. Dave, David, you mentioned in several of your YouTube videos that the golf – let me see. Hold on. Where's the question? Here, go chat box. <laughs> you mentioned in several YouTube videos that golf is a left-hand sport. Does that mean that you left – the left arm control the backswing or downswing. No, what I said is it's a backhanded game. It's a backhanded sport. That's why the gloves on the left hand. So if you think of a tennis player holding the tennis racket in their left hand and then turning their back to the net and then pulling down and taking the racket and putting top spin, a backhanded top spin with their left arm, down line, never cross court, that's a golf swing. I don't know if that makes any any sense to you, but that's why the glove is on the left hand because it's a backhanded game. Otherwise, you'd have had the glove on the right hand. That's a it's a good point that we'll make a, a webinar on just that sometime, or I'll even make a video of that. We'll use it as a drill. Any other questions? For now, we'll call it a night. One quick one to follow up, Bobby. Put your wedge farther back in your stance than your seven iron. Of course, because the club's built that. Well, if you watch that video, it'll explain the whole thing. Okay. It'll explain the whole thing. Oh, okay. But, but the wedge is built this way, and here's a little wedge head. You know, a nine iron's mm -hmm. built this way, an eight iron's built this way, a seven iron's built this way. You know, the driver's built this way. It's the sole mm -hmm. of the club is designed to. To, to go backwards because it's because that the wedge is steeper than a driver right see if you if okay. you're here like this right here he's hitting let's just say a six iron stop it so then a wedge would look like this a driver would look like this mm-hmm See, so the sole of the golf club, this club right here, is going to get to the ground sooner because it's steeper. It's more vertical. So it has the head has to be back further back because the club's going to get to the ground sooner than it is the six iron. And it's going to be here. See the club. I get it. Now. You get it now? Hmm. Yeah. All right. All right, gang. It's my pleasure. Artie, it's good to hear your voice again. We miss not having you around. But uh, hey, Bobby. maybe you can invite us all to your house. We'll sleep in your living room. <laughs> as soon as I have one. What are you doing out. over there? Are you fishing or something? Or what are you doing over there? No, actually, I've been playing a lot of golf um, at the, the club I joined and uh, working on straightening the house out and all, all this furniture we got. You know, we bought a house full of furniture and then moved all of our furniture into it. And it... Uh, it's turned into chaos. Oh, uh, man. We're working on it. We'll get it straightened oh, out man. and get you down here. You got it, partner. Looking forward to it. All right, gang. Hope this helped.
It does. Thanks, Bobby. Thank Thanks, you. Bobby. Hasta Thank luego. You. Enjoyed it. Viva Franco. Thanks, Bobby. Bye-bye. <laughs> Good night. Bye, Art. Good night, David. Good night, Chad.